Hello, this is Jonathan Engelsma. This is part six in our tutorial on learning to program in C. In this tutorial, we're going to look at functions in the C language. We'll start with a brief overview and then we'll get down into the details. We'll look at the anatomy of a C function and how they're put together. We'll talk about the concept of automatic or local variables. We'll also talk about forward declarations of functions and how we can use recursion in C. Finally, we'll talk about functions and arrays and some of the calling semantics of functions in C and how we can affect them. So first, let's look at some basics regarding functions. Functions give us a better tool to modularize our C programs. We can break larger complex programs into smaller, well-defined functions and this makes our code easier to write, read, as well as debug. Now C functions optionally return a single value, but we can use the keyword void to indicate that a function is not going to return any value. In C, functions must be declared prior to their usage. If we fail to do this, as we'll see shortly, the compiler is going to complain. So let's take a look at the anatomy of a function in the C programming language. Every function has a prototype declaration, and this prototype tells us a number of things. It tells us who can call it. It's going to tell us the type of the value it returns, and it's going to tell us the name of the function, as well as the arguments that it takes, if any. So in this per particular example, my function prototype tells me that the return type is int, the name of the function is factorial, and it takes a single argument of type int. Now my functions can also define what we call automatic variables. These are functions declared within the scope of the function. And the variable itself is only available within the function. So as we return from the function, those variables are no longer available. So in my factorial function, you'll see a local variable called retval of type int, which is initialized to 1. Every time I run this function factorial, an instance of retval becomes available and becomes unavailable after we return from the function. Functions will return a type, a, a value that has the same type as the function prototype declared. So in this case, I return retval, which is defined as an int, which matches my prototype. Finally, we can invoke functions by referencing its name and then adding any arguments, and if it has a return value, optionally assigning that value to some variable. So in this particular case, you see where I'm calling factorial with the value 5, and I'm assigning it to another local variable, val, which is defined inside my function main. Now the function itself can replace any expression of its return type. So in this case, it's on the right hand of the equal sign, and it returns an int, so it's perfectly valid to have the variable val initialized to the invocation of the function factorial 5 because that will indeed return an integer. Now we've seen this invocation syntax already in previous lessons when we looked at invoking standard I.O. functions such as printf and scanf and some of the file I.O. routines that we looked at. We can use the keyword void to indicate that a function has re no return value. In this case, um, we can use the return statement without any value after it. So just the keyword return with a semicolon. We can also leave off this return statement altogether in the case of a function with void type. Now if we neglect to put a return type 
on our function prototype, such as in my example function print goodbye here, the compiler is simply going to assume that the return type of this function is an int. In this case, whenever we invoke this function, it's going to expect us to return an int value. And you can see um, that in this particular function we did return the value 1 because it's assumed to have a return type of int. If we did not have that return type, the compiler would complain. Here's an example of a void function where the compiler assumes an implicit return statement. So you'll notice my function print hello returns void and my function itself does not have a return statement. So the compiler here isn't assuming an implicit return. For readability, I would suggest that you always declare your return type when you define a function, or if it has no return type, then be sure to use the keyword void um, in that case. Previously, we mentioned that variables are defined in the scope, the variables defined in the scope of a function are termed automatic. They're automatic in a sense that they're created automatically every time the function is called and deallocated when the function returns. So in this particular example, you'll see that I have a variable Einstein, or I have a function Einstein and a function Albert, and both of these define local variables i. And they're all different, and they're all scoped within the invocation of that particular function. So for example, when I invoke main, the int i that is defined in main actually gets allocated on the runtime stack. So my stack pointer is adjusted to provide space for this local variable to, de to be defined on the call stack. When main invokes Einstein, our stack pointer is increased and we actually add room for the i variable that's defined within the context of Einstein. When Einstein calls Albert, the same thing happens. Our stack pointer is adjusted and the i, the int i defined in Albert also is allocated on the stack. Now there is actually more on the runtime stack than I'm showing here on the right, but just to conceptually uh, help you understand the fact that these are indeed three different int i's even though they all share the same name. They have different scope and they're allocated in different places on the runtime stack. When we return from these functions, the stack pointer is adjusted and that value is no longer available. It's deallocated. Now note that C has a keyword auto for declaring automatic variables. So we can say something like you see on the slide, auto int i equals zero. However, the compiler is smart enough to know when we define an int in a function or any type of variable in a function that it's going to be automatic and allocated in the st stack. So we really don't need to use that keyword. Local variables in a function can also be defined as static, as I show here, static int i equals zero. And what this does is it, it you can think of this as, as sort of pinning that variable down so that it actually persists between function calls. So no matter how many times we call a function with this type of declaration, the value actually persists between calls to that function. Now keep in mind though that the initializer i equals zero is only going to happen the very first time that function is called. Another thing we've already mentioned is that our functions need to be declared before we reference it. Otherwise the compiler doesn't know how to handle the type checking for the arguments as well as that return value. In this example we have a function named Elbert which is called by Einstein the function Einstein, 
before it is defined. So we see in the implementation of the function Einstein an invocation to Albert. In this case, the compiler does not yet know anything about Albert, so it's going to assume that Albert returns an int and takes a character star because it knows that much um, when it encounters the invocation. But this might not be exactly what we want. As we can see, when we actually encounter the function, its return type is void. So when I try to compile this with GCC, as I show here, I'm going to get a warning from the compiler that something unusual is happening. We can correct this problem by simply adding a forward declaration before we reference the function in Einstein. This consists of simply the function's prototype followed by a semicolon. So we're actually leaving off the block of code and we'll define that later in the function. So in this case, the compiler, when it sees the reference to Albert in the function Einstein, it actually knows what the return value as well as the arguments to that function are. And this is exactly what happens in those header files above. So when I include standard io.h and string.h, what those files contain is prototypes without the implementations, exactly as I have the void Albert um, prototype defined at the top of this source file. In that way, the compiler can actually make the right assumptions about these library routines, and then later, when we link the program, the actual object modules will be found in the libraries and linked into our executable program. Here's some suggestions for working with functions in C. So as I've already mentioned, always explicitly declare the return type of your functions and then use void if your function doesn't return anything. Set your expectations clearly so that you in the future when you're maintaining your code can understand your original intentions and more importantly when other developers um, have to maintain or use your code they'll know exactly what your intentions are. And remember the compiler only does proper type conversions for functions when it sees it in advance. If you invoke a function without a declaration, you're going to potentially have problems, which of course the compiler will warn you about. So always define your functions before use when possible or put that function prototype in place. Now a good question might be whether or not you should always check for unexpected or unsupported arguments when you're writing a function. Well, a good rule of thumb is to always program defensively and have your function check its arguments. The reason for that is you might never know who's going to use your function in the future. Other programs might use it that you're not anticipating at this point, and they might be sending you arguments that you're not expecting. So always make sure you check your arguments. On the flip side, you might be wondering about whether or not you should check arguments before you invoke a function. And this too is something you might want to consider, especially in the case where you did not write the function that you're calling or you don't have access to the source code of the function that you're calling. In that case, you'll want to program defensively as well and make sure that you're sending valid arguments to the function. The C programming language also supports recursion. Recursion is a technique in programming where the solution to the problem depends on solutions to smaller instances of the same problem. So in terms of implementation, this means we can solve a problem by having a C function invoke itself with a different set of parameters. For example, here's an example of how we compute a simple factorial using simple recursion. So I've defined a function called factorial that takes an int and it checks whether or not the value coming in is 1 and if it is 
if it is not 1, it's going to return n times factorial n minus 1. There's our recursive call. So when we look at my main routine and I call factorial 5, what in fact happens is I get the value 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which by definition is the factorial of 5. So take a moment and read that code and make sure you understand what's going on there. This is a very powerful tool and often results in elegant, um, concise solutions to various problems we encounter as program programmers. In terms of calling semantics, C functions can utilize either call by value or call by reference semantics. In this particular example, the first two arguments to the add to function get sent by value. So the argument n, which is an int, and inc underscore val, which is also an int, those get, both get sent by value. That means that the copy, uh, that means that copies of these integer variables are going to be placed on the stack and referenced, the, the stack copy is going to be referenced by the function add underscore two. However, arrays in C are always sent by reference. That means that a copy is not made of the data. Instead, an address to the array variable, in this particular example, the parameter vals, an address to that value or that variable is placed on the stack. This has implications, of course. We're sending it by reference, which means when the function changes the values in the array, as this code does, those values are reflected in the array upon return from the function. So if after this invocation of add to with 4, 2, comma sum ints, as I show in the main routine here, if we were to print out the value of the array sum underscore ints, the actual changes made in the addTo function would be reflected. In a later lesson, when we talk about pointers, we're going to see other ways that we can have functions pass values by reference.